there is no stopping an idea whose time has come. But the best entrepreneurs don't stand still with an idea, they get to the business of getting things done. So step forward with your idea, and when you're ready, sit down and tell me how you want to change the world. This week, Venture Capital. Welcome to this week in Venture Capital, and welcome back, actually, I should say. It's been uh, two months since I've done the show. Uh, and no, I wasn't hiding. I've been traveling quite a bit. And as soon as we get the This Week in team to have camera people all over the country, I think I can do this show more regularly. Uh, I'm excited this week to have Tracy Denunzio here. Uh, she founded a business called Recycled Media. And you're going to love the story. It's a very non-typical entrepreneur story. And I'm excited about it. Sorry, it's non-typical from what we read about on TechCrunch or in the press. It's actually incredibly typical, which is why I want so many of you to hear the story. So welcome to This Week in BC. Thank you, Mark. So Recycled Media, what is that? Recycled Media is sort of the parent company of uh, two websites. Our flagship site, RecycledBride.com, is sort of the eBay of weddings. It's the world's largest wedding marketplace where brides buy and sell um, gently used and new wedding items. And we're very excited because we're right about to launch our second property called Style Trader. And Style Trader is a place where you can really just share your closet, where women will buy, sell, and swap um, clothing, accessories, anything fashion or style related. So we're going to come to that in a moment. I just want to sure. make sure we parse both the uh, parts of the business. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, Recycled Bride, I believe, is the URL. Mm -hmm. Recycled Bride. That was your first business, right? Yes. That was the first uh, web property, and you called it eBay for weddings. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean? What are, what are people doing on Recycled Bride? On Recycled Bride, people are just buying and selling, mostly gently used and some new wedding items, and it's primarily wedding dresses. And it's a little bit misleading to call it eBay for weddings because what we do is actually solve a lot of the problems that people find on eBay when trying to transact over items like this, like women's fashion and clothing. Um, but eBay for weddings lets people understand that it's a marketplace. It's a third-party marketplace where buyers and sellers connect. Great. And so... I'm guessing, having someone who's gone through a wedding, uh, you know, really what you're talking about, if you're talking about used stuff, recycled mm -hmm. used stuff for weddings, I'm guessing you're talking about mostly dresses. That must represent the majority of... Yeah, dresses are about 90% of our business, and, okay. and it's really the centerpiece of the wedding, the biggest purchase for the bride, and usually it's the one that we all kind of want a little bit more than we can afford. Right. So that's our... What's the biggest. average cost of a new wedding dress? Any idea? Well, you must know. Of course I know. Um, the average cost across America is about $800, but here in Los Angeles, it's about $1,200. Okay. And that's just an average, you know. Okay. Uh, and so 800 to 1200 and I imagine, and I'm probably not the right demographic to talk more generally about uh, prices of wedding dress, because <laughs> I think in most of the, my peer group, when we all got married, I got married, wow, 10 years ago this July. Congratulations. Um, it was nowhere like $1,200. <laughs> it was much more expensive than that. Yes, yes. I mean, we're in LA or New York, the, the prices definitely go up. And when you talk about averages, there's definitely a skew towards there, there are mass market products and more of them sell in that skews it down. Most of the designer gowns, yeah. um, the really coveted gowns that a lot of people are looking for deals on, start at around $3,000 and average at around five. Is there some element of uh, guilt group or hot look of your website? I mean, are, do you think consumers are coming uh, because they can get designer dresses at a discount or are they looking for an $800 dress that they can buy for $200? They're definitely looking for designer items at a discount. Um, it's interesting because when I launched the site, I thought, well, this is great because it's not just um, helping people save money, it's also helping them be a little bit greener. And this is something that 
you know, one of the many things that you can only learn by operating a business. Um, a few years later, I can tell you that 99% of my users are coming because they want to save money, and only about 12% are concerned with the environment. Right. So that was just something interesting that I learned. You're all about. bad people out there. <laughs> well, you know, the way I look at it, it doesn't matter why they came. Um, they're doing something sustainable, whether right. they know it or chose it because of that or not. So now. Uh, what do you think the typical, well, what is the typical consumer of Recycled Bride? It's interesting. We, we're a very mass market property. So um, our typical consumer has a forty to $60,000 annual um, household income. Okay. Their wedding budget is anywhere from twelve dollars to $18,000. Um, and they're usually, it's, it's just an interesting niche weddings because you'll never see, or you usually won't see, the $800 dresses in the magazines. So it tends to be more aspirational right. than any other vertical where every woman wants to wear a Vera Wang. Right. And, and in other verticals, you don't see that. Um, so, so the typical customer is generally middle class, but definitely aspirational. So talk about whatever you feel comfortable revealing in terms of volumes, either in terms sure. of how many visitors are coming to your site? Mm -hmm. How many dresses are you moving? So this month we had, in January, we had about 350,000 unique visitors. Um, I should, one thing I should say is that we've never done any paid marketing. That's okay. all organic traffic. Okay, so um, we're gonna talk about that because yeah, sure. one of the things I like to offer to this audience is not just learning about wedding dresses. I'm uh -huh. sure some of you want to know about wedding dresses, but really understand the business side. But I think understand the context helps us then to drill in. But sure. So 350,000 uniques, you've never done paid marketing? Never done any paid marketing. That's all organic traffic. Um, we have about 50,000 members on our mailing list, uh, about 85,000 total members, mm -hmm. um, and about 20,000 wedding items for sale. Okay, 20,000 for sale at any point Right now, time. yeah. Mm -hmm. And any sense of either per month or, or if you don't want to reveal per month over the history, how many wedding dresses are we talking about? That gets a little bit tricky okay. to talk about, but um, what I can tell you is that about 10% mm -hmm. of our listings result in a transaction every month. Okay. So we're doing about 10% sales on all of our listings each month. Okay. And the average time that it takes a user to sell is two and a half months. Okay, so let's talk about the buyer and then we'll talk about the seller mm -hmm. in a minute. Well, I guess to some extent you had a chicken and egg problem. You need a bunch of women to list dresses in order people to come to the site and there's a lot of marketplaces that have this chicken and egg problem. How yes. did you solve that? Well, I had no funding when I started. It was all self-funded. Um, so I solved it with straight up guerrilla marketing, right. really. Um, I used to cook big pots of chili and get really nice crusty bread and beg all my friends to come over yeah. and help me do something I probably shouldn't say, but yeah. um, let's just say it probably erred on the side of spamming, but we were okay. definitely looking for people on other marketplaces that had items listed right. in order to start getting some traction. If you're not missing. pushing the boundaries as a startup entrepreneur of what people who wear suits and button-down shirts and look like me would think is appropriate, <laughs> you're probably not trying hard enough. I mean, I think yeah. we all know Airbnb's story. You know, it was mm -hmm. Craigslist and Absolutely. automating yeah. uh, processes to reach out to people on Craigslist. Exactly. You, can, you didn't hear it from me, but you can write scripts that will allow you to contact people on other marketplaces who, who are also... Uh, who and you had some success with that? We had great success with that. That was how we initially seeded the site. And, and then the other thing that I did was um, I... So I'm sorry, just so I can understand that, does that mean that those people, a certain number of them, were listing their wedding dresses for sale elsewhere? Yes. So there was already a marketplace for people who wanted to sell dresses. Yes. And you just wanted to aggregate it into, because, and I won't make you name sites, but they must be selling it on eBay, on Craigslist, on places like that. Mm -hmm. And I guess the buyers, when they go there, didn't feel like it was a place for them. Exactly. So you were able to kind of aggregate that in one place. That exactly, and present it in a way that is more intuitive for women, as opposed to an eBay or a Craigslist, or even some of the other niche sites, wedding sites that were mm -hmm. doing similar things. Um, I just saw an opportunity to mimic the way that women shop in real life right. in an online experience. And um, so that's what we did. And. Uh, the other way that I was able to get listings early on was uh, 
just through, I, I started using Twitter mm -hmm. a lot, but not using it to try and get a ton of followers. Rather, I was identifying influencers in the wedding industry right. and then asking them if I could guest blog for them or create some content for them. Right. So I was a wedding content machine for right. the first six months or so. Well, that's interesting. So that's something I think that's worthwhile for people to hear. You reach out to people. Mm -hmm. uh, you reach out via Twitter, which we'll talk about in a moment. Mm -hmm. But you, your strategy was if I could, you guest blogged? Is that what you yeah. did? Or, okay. guest blogging, guest posting. Yeah. And with links back to your website? Yep. And that raised the awareness for what you did mm -hmm. and also created some link juice. Exactly, exactly. And so your view was part of my time as a startup founder who has no money is I've got to market myself. Mm -hmm. What better than to find places where there's already traffic to get my exactly. name known and to drive traffic back to me. Exactly, and it was kind of brick by brick. I started with some smaller blogs because nobody knew who I was. Mm -hmm. And then after I'd been blogging for them for a few months, I was able to approach the bigger sites and say, hey, look, I'm, I'm a wedding blogger. I'm a wedding expert. Here I am writing for all these sites. Would you like me to create original content for you as well? Um, but it's also worth noting that I didn't haphazardly reach out because your, your time is your biggest asset mm -hmm. when you're starting up. And um, so I was very, very conscious of targeting exactly who I wanted to work with and kind right. of following them on Twitter for a while. Stalking them. Researching them, <laughs> totally stalking them. I mean, really, really stalking yeah. people. But nobody ever said no. Because okay. by the time I contacted them, I was their best friend. They just didn't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I have this discussion all the time. I, I think a lot of entrepreneurs like to blog to their friends. And what I mean is they write blogs on how do you raise money, how do you start a business, how do I hire an engineering team. And my recommendation is not to do that. And I generally say you need to blog to your customer base. Now, I Absolutely. blog about how to raise money and how to be an entrepreneur. Because we're your customers. Because you're my customers, right? <laughs> totally. And, uh, you know, otherwise I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, unless I was feeling narcissistic. Actually, I like it. But, um, <laughs> but the best people who have done this successfully are people like Mint. Mm -hmm. that became the authoritative place for blogging about uh, personal finance. And they didn't write, how do you design a website? They wrote, right. how do you balance your checkbook? Um, and uh, I also talk often about Magento because Magento talked, they, they actually invested in building a community where people could come write articles mm -hmm. about e-commerce. And they mm -hmm. became one of the top destinations and therefore became the top search term for the word e-commerce. Oh, wow. Um, so this sounds like this was your strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I definitely didn't spend, a, most of what I did had nothing to do with weddings. I right. was very busy with product and marketing and, and development and all that stuff, but that's not my audience. Right. So um, to me, I just wanted to be where the customers were. And uh, did you also keep a blog on Recycled Bride, or you mm -hmm. just guest blogged and drove traffic? Oh no, I was blogging on Recycled Bride too. Okay, I really wrote a lot of wedding content. <laughs> was that an important? Is that important for customer acquisition and customer retention? It's interesting. Uh, I mean, a lot of businesses. The the thing that I don't like is doing anything just because people say you should. Right. right. Blogging, social media. So. I think that a blog can be an important component of a startup, but if it's going to be an important component of yours, you have to give it that attention. Right. So yes, in the beginning, it was an important component of our customer acquisition, and for some time, most of our visitors were coming through the blog. But as our other efforts, particularly with SEO and social media, started to kick in, the blog was generating less and less traffic. Now it represents 2% of our overall traffic. Right. Now, I do want to say this, though, is I, that probably doesn't capture the full effect of it. And here's what I mean is I, I often talk about this kind of circular reinforcement between blogging and social media. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. if you blog, that itself brings visitors. 
People who come to your blog then say, I want to follow this person on social media. Yes. You then create the social media presence where you sometimes promote your blog, you sometimes promote other things, you mm -hmm. build kind of a public persona for what you do. Mm -hmm. The more you do that, the more followers you have on social media, the more people the read your blog, the more people read your blog, the more people who follow your social media. Absolutely. And, and actually, one of the ways like I've noticed in, in my own Twitter following going up has been if I write, my Twitter following expands faster because more people are retweeting. Yes. And as retweeting happens, people discover you more, mm -hmm. right? Because you're reaching friends of friends. And that kind of viral adoption really matters. And I think it's more holistic than people acknowledge. It is, and it does matter so much. And I think the thing, the reason that I don't know if it's necessarily a key component of, of every startup or of mm -hmm. even of most startups is because the amount of time, effort, and energy that it takes to, I mean, if you already have a public persona that people right. are really interested in what you're saying, then it's easier. But when you're a startup coming out of nowhere and you're writing content about what your customers like, it's very hard to get a following. There are very few people out there who really follow a ton of little blogs and will check up on you every day and become devoted followers. So I just think that it's important to identify that as either a key component that you're willing to put 50% of all your time into, or to identify other ways that are gonna be your big wins for What traffic. other ways have been big wins for you? SEO is our big win. Okay. Um, we have something, I, I told you a little bit about it, and it's yep. somewhat proprietary, okay. but. Um, is there anything that you feel not proprietary that we could tell people? Sure, absolutely. Um, so, w first of all, uh, I studied SEO religiously every night when I started this business because I didn't have a background in it. And How did you do that? What were the most informative sites? Did you go to SEO Moz? For SEO example? Moz is yeah. great, okay. and and now I teach SEO workshops. And, do and you really? Yeah, and and people learn in different ways, so right. those things can be useful. But honestly, Google it because it's all there. Do you know? do you teach SEO workshops just to give back, or what's? Yeah, why? I do. Okay. I, I I mean, I think when I started about a year ago. It was also to bring in extra money because... Mm -hmm. um, or you got paid to do it. Yeah, yeah. I do it through a group called Women of the Green Generation, and it's okay. a lot of women who have sustainable businesses. So okay. I'm mostly... Now it's like mostly to give back. Okay. Um, but I, um, I, I recognized an opportunity early on because I was doing so much research, and I understood that what we had was quite a bit of content aggregation because we have user-generated content, and that there were certain ways that I could make that content work for us. And so now we have exponential growth coming from all of our listings. Um, okay. Meaning that they're, all of our listings rank well mm -hmm. and drive visitors in. And I just think that not every business is, is appropriate. SEO is necess not necessarily. So, so just you know, at the at the fifty thousand foot layer, yeah. and most of our viewers will know this, but I'm being some vague. won't. What's <laughs> a, yeah, no, it's okay. But like the things that matter, inbound links. Mm -hmm. matter, mm -hmm. uh, inbound links that have very specific tags to them. Anchor text. Yeah. Anchor text. And inbound links that point to very specific keywords that have keyword density on your site. So yes. I guess what you're saying is you, and I won't peel into proprietary <laughs> stuff, but you know, this is pretty 101. Yeah, you no, it's design, not like that. But you design yes. listings for terms that you know, because you must also use yes. like, the, there's a search tool mm -hmm. that you can use from Google that will show you the exactly. search terms that people are using. Exactly. You want to figure out what are the most common search terms and you want to align them and you also probably want a degree of long tail search. So if you search two words like wedding dress, you're going to be on page 500. If and you we search, don't care about that. Yeah, yeah, if you search, I guess, Vera Wang used wedding dress Exactly. Los Angeles, I guess you're going to be top us. one or two. Yes, exactly, exactly. And you know, one thing also that people don't talk about a lot with SEO, but I think it's really valuable and important, all those things like getting your metadata in order and getting your, your backlinks and all that are really important. But once you start ranking, another super important factor is how long people are staying on your site when they come through certain keywords, okay. right? Because Google's just trying to be the best search engine out mm -hmm. there. And if you're providing really valuable results and they see that once you start ranking, you rank even higher. And so because we have sort of this- You get something called page rank. Yes. And the higher your page rank, then the yes. higher you rank. 
you get PageRank because you have all these links coming in, and then you get something called domain authority because mm -hmm. Google sees that everyone who's coming into your site through Google keywords, they're staying for a while or they're turning a bunch of pages. So that really worked to our benefit too because we have all these clickable listings. Um, right. So the average time on our site is something like eight minutes. We get about 12 pages turned per visitor. And I really believe that that was important. Once we started ranking somewhere low on that first page, we very quickly made it up to the top of a lot of pages. And, and I think that was because the site was so, was providing valuable content for exactly what people were searching for. Now, let's talk about economics. You <laughs> made the decision to allow people to list initially one item for free. Mm -hmm. Now, given that most women get married once or twice, mm -hmm. given that 90% uh, of revenue comes from the wedding dress, mm -hmm. didn't you give away the goose letting people list for free? I mean, how did you come to that conclusion? Because, and how do you make money? Because, well, I came to that conclusion because listings are our power. The larger your market, it's, it's that chicken and egg thing, right? So the more sellers you have, the more listings you have, mm -hmm. the more customers you have, okay. because those listings are attracting customers. Yep. The last thing I want to do as the owner of a marketplace is limit the content on my yep. site, because then I'm limiting the number of customers I can bring in, the buyers. Um, so. That decision was made early on just because we needed to grow fast. And we right. knew that eventually we'd go to a freemium or a commission model, but that initially it was a free for all. We just wanted the listings. Right. Um, once it came time to monetize, I decided to still allow one free listing because again, that traffic is so valuable to us in advertising mm -hmm. and in the traffic that it draws. Well, so that's to interesting. Set. So you also sell advertising. So oh, yes. is that like, again, you don't have to give me exacts, but is that more than 50% of your revenue? Or? It's a little bit more than 50% of okay. our revenue. And, and advertising does really well for us in this vertical. Most of what I do now has to do with optimizing advertising. Um, okay. That's a lot of what I spend my time on. And um, it's an interesting world, and and the and the other thing that you do is you you allow people to do kind of promoted dresses exactly. if they want premium membership. Premium. So we have two levels. We have a plus membership, which allows a, a regular seller to sell up to six items, and to get highlighted featured listings mm -hmm. that are rotated into the homepage. It's sixty three percent more buyer inquiries and sell three times faster. That's what our metrics right. show us. Um, then we have a pro level account, mm -hmm. which allows um, retailers, wholesalers, anyone who has overstock or inventory uh, in, in bridal to sell on our site and directly access our users. What percentage of dresses sold do you imagine or do you know are from like individuals who just had an extra dress versus these businesses that might have overstock inventory or other types of used dresses? So, about 95% of the sales are individual to individual, mm -hmm. and about 1.5% of our sellers are pros. Okay, and what so, about revenue, people who pay for the premium listing? Uh, we have 1.5% are pros, and 3.5% are plus members, so 5% of our members are paying. Okay. And it does very nicely for us. It's a, it's a subscription model, mm -hmm. so it's nine ninety five a month at the plus level, nineteen right. ninety five a month at the pro level. and. It's and working. We're we're always testing. And it's not talk about talk about this. You said uh, more than fifty percent of your um, revenue is currently coming from advertisers, and you're spending a lot of time optimizing advertisers. What does that mean? What are you doing? Well, advertising is its all own whole sort of job. Did you start? I'm sorry, I asked a question, sure, then I want to ask okay. a follow up question, but this is related. Did you? start by selling your own advertising yes. or did you have an ad network or work with federated media or someone like that? I started with just Google ads mm -hmm. and then direct sales of our own advertising. Um, and maybe about six months ago, what I noticed was that the Google ads were actually earning us a little bit more money than even our direct ad sales were, wow. but that we kind of hit the ceiling on what we could sell direct ads for because for whatever reason, we were attracting a lot of smaller wedding vendors who were on okay. a budget. So I started adding in more networks. Right now we run five different advertising networks on the site. What are some of the ad networks you run? Burst Media, mm -hmm. Advertising.com, which is a division of AOL, mm -hmm. uh, AdBright, mm -hmm. I just added buy ads, mm -hmm. iSocket. It's so like do a, you have a software, I mean I know there's people like Rubicon Project or right. AdMeld or Pubmatic that help you to then optimize that or do you do it yourself? I manually optimize. We're mm -hmm. probably this close to 
it being worthwhile to, to get an, an ad management software. Mm -hmm. Although, when that time comes, it'll be a decision between doing that or hiring someone who handles direct ad given, sales. Given your niche audience, I would imagine that relative to your page views, you could sell a lot more expensive yes. like campaigns where it's like a takeover of the whole site. And totally. So, in, it, and, and I just don't have the manpower right, right now. Uh, and I, you know, I like to do things um, when they're already really warranted as opposed to um, prematurely, if that makes sense. Okay. So when we had 200 or 250,000 uniques a month, it really didn't make sense to hire someone who could go out and do those direct ad sales because I wasn't sure that those numbers were going to add up, that paying that person's salary right. was going to. Now that we're driving a little bit more traffic, we have a lot more visibility, I, and I can see that we're just about at the point where there's definitely going to be value, I'm ready to add that in. So. I guess once you are very good at acquiring traffic and you have these must be 99% women uh, customers, yeah. it seems like such a waste to get them there and just have them buy a wedding dress as opposed to like all the other stuff you could sell them. Uh, yes. How did you start to think about that problem set and decide what other markets you should go into? Did you try some things? Did they work? I thought about that almost from day one. Mm -hmm. Once I realized how hard it was to acquire a customer, mm -hmm. I realized I really didn't want to let them go yeah. after their wedding. Yeah. Uh, and so initially, I kind of, it, it was a misstep. One of, one of the early things I did immediately after launching Recycled Bride, I launched Recycled Tyke. Okay. A lot of holes in the concept. It doesn't work as well as bridal. Why? Um, predominantly because with baby and kids items, if it is expensive enough to be worth reselling, mm -hmm. it is too heavy to ship. Okay. Or, or it'll be just too expensive to ship. Therefore, you would need to have more of a local marketplace situation mm -hmm. like Craigslist, mm -hmm. and we just didn't have the resources to grow quickly enough to mm -hmm. have That's interesting, because you took the idea and said it could just work the same, but the product type yeah. and the customer type matters. It matters so and much. And so what did you, did you shut down Recycled Tyke, or? Just kind of left it okay. and, and let it run, and, and it has some customers, but and it's not so something So what else then on. have you tried? So, well, we're about to launch the product that I'm so proud of and excited about that's been at least a year in the making. Uh, it's called styletrader.com. Okay. And it's uh, it's basically a place where you can where women can share their closets. Okay. So there's buying and selling just like on Recycled Bride, but mm -hmm. we added another component that I think is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And that's swapping. Mm -hmm. We have a swap shop within the site where women can essentially constantly update their wardrobes without spending any money. Mm -hmm. And swapping doesn't happen on a direct one to one basis. Mm -hmm. There's a, a credit system. Okay. So you know, I might see Jennifer's shirt and love it, and I can get it sent to me, and my credits will be debited, and then I can send my my jeans to Amy right. and get some credit back. And so it's just, it's almost like having a million sisters that right. you can share your closet with. And do you take a vig on that? Do you take a slice? Yeah. So the the we haven't launched this yet. This okay. is going to launch in about a month. Um, at launch in beta, that'll be a premium feature. Right. So there'll be a monthly membership fee, okay. and part of the one of the perks for being a premium member will be having access to the swap shop. It seems that th this idea of crowd-connected commodities that are super expensive in the real world that don't need to be really taken off. I mean, we can see it from Airbnb. Yep. Um, you know, share a ride. There's a number of these that are emerging. Task Rabbit. Mm -hmm. Um, that are trying to get communities of people all working together. Um, it, did, were you inspired by watching any of these other? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think that there's so much about the new levels of connectivity that we have that can actually help us to not just speed up our lives and, and, and do a bunch of busy work, but actually create more value and sustainability in our lives. And, and that's really inspiring to me personally. So I look at my closet and there's, it's a funny statistic. They say the average woman only wears 30% of what's in her closet. Right. For me, I think it's like 5%. Right. And I think, you know, here are all these items that have a value. They actually have a value. And, but there's nothing I can do about it. 
Um, and of course, I could sell on eBay, but there's a lot about eBay that's just not intuitive for this market. And I suppose market. the interesting thing is you might not actively want to go out there and try to tell everybody, come buy my stuff. But if you could just list it and if you're a part of a community and if someone likes something, you might be willing to part with it. Exactly, exactly. And it's also kind of like Style Trader is also in a way like a Facebook for your closet. You know, mm. we all love as women to sort of catalog what we own and yeah. maybe display it and be able to play with it. So there are a lot of fun features in there that let you, you don't necessarily have to sell everything, but you can post it and you can put together outfits and right. there's a lot of interactive sort of community-based um, tools in there that, that just let you be collaborative about your, your belongings and your style. Awesome. Yeah. And. So you came up with this concept, and I guess you hooked up with somebody quite known in the industry, the, the founder of Daily Candy, am I right? Yes. I, How did you connect? I mean, having a mentor who built something so successful, I guess, has helped you a bit. How did you get so access to her? How valuable is that? It's so valuable, and I was so lucky. It was, it was happenstance. Uh, a friend of a friend uh, who I got stuck in traffic with one evening, I was telling him about Style Trader, and it was still just kind of the germ of an idea. And he said, Danny Levy would love this. And I thought, Danny Levy, my God, she's kind of my CEO idol. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I didn't really expect an intro because a lot of people say they're going to make intros. Right. And, but he, he introduced us, and, uh, and I met with her, and I was nervous, and I drank too much wine before she showed up. And, <laughs> Uh, but not, not a recommended strategy. <laughs> not recommended at all, <laughs> but, but, but it worked out well. We got along really well, and I think that she saw something in this business similar to, to her path with Daily Candy that she really liked and felt inspired by. So we're her, her only investment wow. uh, since she exited Daily Candy. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, I have to do a very brief ad. Mm -hmm. uh, you sell ads, but we have to sell ads to oh, keep yeah. the show going, of which none goes to me, by the way. Um, Mosey, Mosey Pro is an online backup system. I know a lot of you think you should be backing up. You might even have a local time machine that's backing up your Mac or whatever. Uh, but I can tell you firsthand, I actually backed up to a local device and when my hard drive crashed, my local device didn't work either. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth thinking about cloud solutions. It's, uh, it's, it's an insurance policy, both as an individual it's an insurance policy on your family pictures, but they also have something called the Mosey Data Shuttle, and that allows you to back up your servers uh, to a Mosey data center, and that's quite easy to do. The best way to check it out is at Mosey, M-O-Z-Y, pro, P-R-O, dot com, or for you Brits, M-O-Z-Y, pro, dot com. Thanks, Mosey. Um, let's go back to your origins, because I find this quite interesting. You. You're not a programmer by by design. No. Um, you didn't even think you were going to be a business person. What did you start doing? I was an artist. An I, artist. I was a painter. Yeah. Okay. Um, that was what I did for ten years. Yeah. Uh, I traveled. I painted. I, you know, sold my art. Bohemian. Kind of bohemian. Yeah. yeah. It was kind of bohemian. How does one go from being a painter and a bohemian life to being a an internet entrepreneur? I still ask myself that. Yeah. It's um, it's still kind of a bohemian life too. But uh, it it was kind. I kind of fell backwards into it. Nobody was buying paintings after two thousand eight. Yeah. Uh, I knew that I kind of wanted to do something that was more challenging and interactive. And at the time, I was actually married to someone who had started an internet company. Okay. My my ex husband was the co founder of MovieFlix dot com. Oh really? Oh, cool. Yeah, it was one of the first websites ever to put movies on yep. the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, so I kind of peek over his shoulder and give him my thoughts, and he said, "You know, you you have a knack for this. You should be doing this." Right. Uh, but. I really didn't know what I was getting into. I'm really glad I did. Right. But I, it just sort of happened. Um, How'd you get your first website built? I mean, if you're not a developer, did you find a tech co-founder, or what did you do? I didn't. Uh, I I hired someone, a freelance guy, who didn't deliver anything. Right. I went through that painful experience. I think we've all had that experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I moved over to an agency he based here in LA. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called Ender Technology. They've what is been it called? Ender Technology. Ender Technology. They're great. I'm still with them right now. I'm looking okay. for a technical co-founder if there are any out there. But uh, great technology people. Note: Tracy yes. has funding. She's part of Launchpad LA, which uh, I'm a part of as well. So we have funded her, and 
Um, you're not even out trying yet to raise a big round. You're focused on your business. You have real revenue. Mm -hmm. I think you even turned a profit, right? Yeah, we're profitable. Uh, turned a profit, $50,000 from us, mm -hmm. and you're gonna hire a technical co-founder. Yes. And when you get to the next level, then go out and raise, I guess, a seed round? Yes, exactly. We'll do a Series A in a few months, but I, st I, wanna, I wanna build as much equity into the company as possible every step of the way before yeah, raising money. For sure. Yeah. Um, and so you had an agency build product for you? I had an agency build product. It was, I mortgaged my whole life to, yeah. to get that product built. Uh, and but it was well worth it. Order um, of magnitude, how much did it cost you to get that going? Twenty thousand dollars. Okay. And which for a struggling painter is quite a bit of money. It was quite a bit of money. I, I really I mean, the day we launched I was dead broke mm -hmm. and it was me and that website. And, and you had no income, so how did you pay the bills? Uh any way I could. I mostly. Uh, well, we know. We already know that you started teaching SEO. <laughs> I started teaching SEO. I yeah. did a little bit of consulting, but in the beginning, I couldn't even do that. Um, I was renting out all of my space on mm -hmm. Airbnb. You rented so, out your room on Airbnb. I have. Well, presumably not your room, your spare room. Well, at first I slept on the couch, and I rented out both bedrooms in my You're apartment. You're kidding no. me! You slept on the couch yeah. and rented out your bedrooms. And I had a, a developer living in my storage unit <laughs> who who was building in legal? extra features. Don't say that. Was not legal. <laughs> my landlord yeah. has so had happy. it up to here with me now. So, um, but why didn't you just get a roommate? I, it was more money renting on Airbnb. So I was able to rent by the night, two rooms. I was able to almost or actually sometimes cover my entire rent that way so that I had no rent. Roommates I mean, how, don't pay your whole rent. <laughs> how often did you have people staying there? People were coming and going all the time. Like, uh, I mean, I was, like I always- four nights a week, two nights a week? Um, almost every night there were, the, it was at least one guest. Almost every night? Like, yeah. how much did you make in a year on Airbnb? Uh, about $18,000, and I don't even think I was doing it for the full calendar year that year. $18,000 yes. you made? Yeah, that funded the business. $18,000? Yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. that's phenomenal. I mean, I think initially I didn't fully grasp the power of Airbnb it's for, incredible. not just for people who want to be able to get cheaper places, but I just never thought there would be enough people like you who would want to give out your room, but for $18,000 for someone you know, struggling to build a business, that's pretty meaningful. Absolutely, and it's funny because people- I mean, I suppose you owe the fact that you were able to build your business somewhat to Airbnb. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm Airbnb's biggest fan. I also That's met wild. my husband through Airbnb, yeah. my, so so I really, really love Airbnb. <laughs> but, uh, and then I guess you weren't sleeping on the couch anymore. No, right? exactly. Then we were renting out the guest room. Yeah, and, but did you still, after you became a couple, continue to rent out your room? Absolutely, absolutely, because I still had, it's funny, I always said, well, when I get here, it, it, we won't need to do that anymore. But you're always building. Yeah. So even once we had revenue, I didn't want to just take that revenue and use it to pay my rent. I wanted to be right. able to put it back into the company. Talk about the struggles of being a single co-founder and not even a co-founder who then brought in a tech team and a dev team and a marketing team and had five or six people, but for a long time you were kind of a one woman band, I guess. Uh -huh. and, and in some ways I still am. Hmm. Um, and now it's time to change that and, yeah. and I'm looking for, I'm putting together a team. but. Um, you know, in a way it's a struggle, but I think in a way it was a benefit to me. Um, when you feel like a one woman army, you know, there's, it, it's, and everything rides on your shoulders, it kind of inspires terror yeah. <laughs> and also a lot of motivation. And I didn't have to kind of quibble with anybody yeah. about the details, I could just go. Well, could I say this? I feel like um, that's well suited to certain types of people. You've obviously accomplished a lot on your own. My experience is a lot of people have the opposite impact, yes. which is when you're on your own, it's easy to put stuff off. In some ways, bringing on someone else into your team, whether they're a co-founder or just empl employee, it gives you someone else to be responsible for. Yes. And a lot of people derive their motivation from that. It's like, oh shit, I can't let everybody else down. Yep. Um, and I think on top of that, and, and somewhat taking money from people has that kind of motivation. But also I Definitely. feel like having a sparring partner, it's not always slowing you down. Sometimes it's forcing you to sharpen the saw. 
Sure, and I made mistakes, you know, and and may not have made those. You if, make mistakes even if you have a team. Well, me. right, and I mean the. To me, the biggest benefit of it was just that ability to move so quickly. But yes, of course, I missed out on just an extra pair of hands and some and a sounding board. And there are many times that you get, as a single founder especially, you get too deeply engaged in what you're doing that you lose perspective. And I've right. definitely been guilty of that. Uh, my number one request of people, I always say it this way, is... I don't necessarily believe in two people starting a business together. I think that creates inherent problems, but I know a lot of people do. Um, I believe in one person creating a business and then hiring their co-founder and giving a meaningful equity. I don't believe in like hogging equity. I believe in meaningful equity. Absolutely. Um, but whatever you do, I always tell people you need to hire your sparring partner. Mm -hmm. You know, that person who is not a sycophant uh -huh. They're not just going to tell you yes. They're like going to get in your face. They're going to get in your grill, and they're going to tell you what's what. And uh, you know, I had a sparring partner at both my companies. Uh, his name was Stuart Lander. Um, he started as a junior guy at my first company, but he was the guy who just told me when I was full of shit, and I kind of like that. I, I had other, many other sparring partners. Uh, you know, my two co-founders of my second company. One was um, the head of technology, Ryan Lissack, and the head of product, Tim Barker. Um, and they just never let me get away with anything. And I don't want to, maybe, I don't want to perpetuate a myth that I did it alone because yeah. I have a few advisors mm -hmm. who are also friends who, who were so tremendously supportive and went above and beyond the call of duty and did call me on my crap yeah. all the time, sometimes when I didn't want to hear it. Um, so, you know, I have to say I definitely had people. I, I accept that, but it's it's an order of magnitude different when that person is not getting paid alongside you yeah. because they take it a lot more seriously. I wasn't getting paid, but no, I that's what I mean. I said when they're not not getting oh, when they're paid also alongside not getting paid, right? you, right? Uh -huh. Like it's one thing to be an advisor, and I can give you some nice, friendly advice. And we can fight about it, but like if I haven't been paid in four months, and I'm like, your ass needs to get out there and figure out this revenue model, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, I yes. just think it's a degree more serious. I would highly recommend sparring partners to all of you. Uh, talk about what it means to be a female entrepreneur. Does that add any elements of challenge to you? Do you perceive any more or less difficulties as a result of that? It's a difficult topic and I sometimes get like a little bit crucified when I talk about this because to me, there's no, there's no difference. Yeah. Um, I've been to whole events talking about this glass ceiling in the technology mm -hmm. world, and to be honest, I don't see it. Right. Um, I feel like revenue is the define, like it, it's the defining line. Mm -hmm. If you can walk into a room and say, I started with nothing or with this little pile, and I turned it into a big pile, mm -hmm. nobody cares what body parts you have. Right. Um, and in some ways, uh, you know, if there's a perception that as a woman I may not know as much or be as savvy, then that's awesome because I'm starting with lower expectation <laughs> and I can blow it out of the water. Yeah. Um, so for me, it hasn't been an issue. I think there may be some lack of well, role models. Let me models. throw out some stereotypes, and sure. I don't want to get in trouble for this. These are stereotypes, not what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, you strike me, having started to get to know you through Launchpad, you strike, strike me as someone who speaks your mind, who speaks up, who's a bit sparky, if I could use that word. Um, I would say, stereotypically, women can be in a room where men are a lot more about one-upping each other and having to, like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fight about who's right and who's wrong. And women are, in many ways, stereotypically, more sensible. Uh -huh. And that sensibility means they don't need to get in the fray and maybe don't speak up as much on their own behalf as they otherwise would. And I've read a lot about this yes. stereotype of women. Do you think any of that's true? I mean, you don't, it doesn't seem to be in your character, but do you perceive any of that? Yeah, I mean, there's that old thing, right? Like a man, a man who speaks up for himself is strong and a woman who speaks up for herself is a bitch. Yeah. And, but I think that there's a, a mistake or a, something that a lot of women do where when they get into the business world, they try to act like men. Yeah. And then there's this kind of bitch perception, right? Yeah. I don't feel like, um, I don't feel like I have any problem speaking up. Um, but I also do, I, I do it from a very feminine point of view because yeah. I am really a, a woman. And so, 
I am. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, I think it's I think the dynamics are always different for everyone. Yeah. So it's a hard topic to speak on. But for if you're a woman entrepreneur, I think the first step is forget you're a woman and focus on your bottom line revenue. Mm. Stop worrying about. But it's, it's easy to say this focus on your bottom line revenue, but as you know, many tech businesses, when they start, don't immediately have revenue, and they need to get capital in order to get revenue, and they need to acquire a team, and they need to get biz dev, and they need to... I, I think yeah. focusing on your business success and momentum and moving the ball forward is a fair statement. Focusing yeah. on revenue isn't always possible at the stages at which you need to convince people. That's true. That is true. So I, I was talking to our CFO. Mm -hmm. um, she's a woman. Mm -hmm. And actually, she was interviewed in the LA Business Journal. They, uh, I think they chose 10 or 15 like power women of Los Angeles finance or something like that. And uh, so we were, we were chatting about her interview. And she was saying her husband then, someone she was dating, gave her advice, which I, made me laugh, but I thought was spot on, which was don't be afraid to tell people when you're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I think that, again, there's something in, in the delivery of it, right? So I do think that it can be harder for some men, not all, to have a woman uh, who ranks higher than them or be mm -hmm. their boss or, or call the shots. Um, and, you know, but again, sometimes it's hard for men that have male bosses that call the shots. And, right. and so you're either a good boss or you're like that jerk boss mm -hmm. and I don't know if it has to do with being a man or a woman again I mean this is just my experience so it's it's very hard for me to speak to this mm -hmm. because for me it feels like a non-issue I right. think that what feminism did for us was that we were supposed to just it was supposed to be a non-issue and, yeah. and I feel at least in my world and what I've encountered so far that it is for yeah. me There is no stopping an idea whose time has come. But the best entrepreneurs don't stand still with an idea. They get to the business of getting things done. So step forward with your idea. And when you're ready, sit down and tell me how you want to change the world. This week, Venture Capital.